네, 여러분 안녕하십니까? Good afternoon. Welcome to the special session one for the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2021. Thank you for joining us. We have a online offline conference for this year. Thank you very much for joining us despite your busy schedules. Thank you also to our online participants. Let us now start special session one for Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2021. This session is titled The Way of the Korean Peninsula Towards Peace and Unification. We will have research assistant Wang Sung Tech who will moderate this session. Please welcome our moderator with a big round of applause. Uh -huh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special session of Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2021. I am Son Tae Gwang, a former diplomatic correspondent at YTN. It's a cable TV news channel in uh, Korea. And currently, actually I retired last year. Uh, currently I am a research associate at Yoshije, a future consensus institute, which is a, one of the private uh, think tanks in Seoul. I am honored and delighted to chair this session the way of the Korean Peninsula toward peace and unification. I am also excited to uh, join this session, not only because it is meaningful, but also because uh, the topic is really significant and will be inspiring to the Korean Peninsula. Let me introduce today's topic for a minute. We are to discuss some details about the Abraham Accords which is a series of peace deals with Israel and uh, neighbor countries in Middle East or North Africa, including the United, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan since August last year. Uh, the Abraham Accords are probably the most significant uh, success story among diplomatic movements in recent years. We hope that uh, our discussion today on the successful peace deals could produce some insights, lesson, or wisdom so that we can apply them for situation in the Korean Peninsula. We are honored to have four foreign ambassadors to the Republic of Korea from the signing nations of the Abraham uh, Accords, including Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Morocco, and together with German ambassador to Seoul. Before we start, I'd like to inform you a couple of housekeeping rules, a time plan. We begin with the presentations from six panels. Uh, each panel will deliver about seven minutes, maximum 10 minutes. And then uh, we will have a free discussion among panels. And then uh, if we have time, I would like to open the discussion uh, to the floor and have a Q&A uh, time. Uh, maybe about 10 minutes. So this is the time plan we have at the moment. Now it is time for the first speaker, His Excellency Ambassador Baek Bum Hum. He's one of the organizers of this wonderful event today. So he will elaborate, elaborate the meaning and the purpose of this session. Ambassador Baek, please go ahead. Baek Bum Deshaimida. Hello, as introduced, I am Baek Bong Hum. Let me begin my presentation. Gangwon Province is the only divided province on the Korean Peninsula. New, numerous nuclear and missile tests led to the worst inter-Korean relations in 2017, but Gangwon Province held sporting events with North Korean participation despite these challenges and contributed to building peace on the Korean Peninsula with North Korea participating in the Pyeongchang Olympics. However, after a new deal at DPRK US Hanoi summit in February 2019, North Korean borders have been closed due to COVID-19 in 2020, and events such as blowing up of joint liaison office in Kaesong Industrial Park in June 2020, and killing of a South Korean official by the North near NLL in the West Sea in September 2020 resulted in the impasse in the inter-Korean relations. As such, Gangwon Province has also had many concerns. 
So far, North Korea has been refusing projects, proposals, or assistance involving South Korea or Gangwon province. Nevertheless, in 2021, in this new year, we see some positive and hopeful signs that indicate new changes. After the U.S. presidential election, the Biden administration took office. Now, with this new U.S. administration, I believe that there are some very positive signs for improved relations between the U.S. and DPRK. And secondly, as there are developments in COVID-19 vaccines and treatments, I believe that it is time for North Korea to open up its borders and they need to work with the international community, including South Korea. In addition, at the 8th party convention in January this year, North Korea announced that there will be new attempts for external relations after they address their domestic issues. When you think about the situations on the Korean Peninsula, as of today, it is the only divided country in the world. However, Germany and Vietnam have already achieved unification decades ago. And the Israel, UAE, Morocco, and Sudan, and Bahrain, they established or restored diplomatic relations in 2020 in order to promote mutual security and economic interests. Gangwon province wants to learn lessons from Germany, where both conservative and liberal sides joined forces and, and achieved unification. We would also like to review how Vietnam was able to achieve reconciliation and integration after unification through various programs and policies. And we would also like to learn lessons from the Arab countries, where they have built or restored ties with the neighboring countries to respond to the changing political situation. And in doing so, we want to emphasize the importance of working together domestically and um, internationally to promote peace and better inter-Korean relations on the Korean Peninsula. Since the Vietnamese ambassador to Korea was not able to attend, we will hear from Vietnam uh, on another occasion to learn how they were able to pursue reconciliation and integration. And given this background, advisor Ki Young Gil will explain the background behind the special session and the ambassadors from the Middle East can discuss the background behind such diplomatic moves and how you were able to improve the relations. And the German ambassador may discuss the unification process and all these ambassadors may also discuss the implications for peace and unification on the Korean Peninsula, what this session can do to contribute to peace and unification. And finally, Dr. Wang, who is also serving as the moderator, will make concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Peck. Uh, now it is time for uh, uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Lee Young-gil. Uh, Yes, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Lee Young Gil is an advisor to the governor of Gangwon Province regarding international exchanges and cooperation. He's also one of the organizers for this event. My understanding is that, as uh, uh, Ambassador Peck said, is that he is going to talk about some behind the stories about how this wonderful event uh, could be organized. So, Dr. Lee, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um... As mentioned, uh, I'm an advisor to the governor of Gangwon, uh, Mr. Che Moon Soon, in future strategy and public diplomacy. The government of Gangwon has been emphasizing the public diplomacy aspect uh, since about two years ago, and we've seen a very uh, you know, significant uh, aspect in this. In fact, uh, this is not a behind the story, but I like to say how we have come to this point, inviting ambassadors in the Middle East and the ambassador of Germany uh, to this platform so that we Koreans listen to them and also hopefully they listen to us. 
in such a way that we can find the better way of doing peace in a good international atmosphere. The, the very point that we started with in the government of Gangwon is what we saw in the news. That was Peace to Prosperity Forum. Uh, that was facilitated by the White House in the US. And they facilitated in such a way that they want to approach the conflict issue from the point of prosperity, not just talking political issues among the heads of the states, but according to their logic, why don't we take a look at this significant aspect of economic cooperation by which we can reach the, the higher level of prosperity? That was quite successful. I, I believe that from that platform, it has come to a political agreement called Abraham Accord. That was very inspiring to all of us because that was a diplomatic agreement. In the countries, Israel, UAE, Morocco, and the Sudan, Bahrain, and those countries, uh, they have not had a diplom diplomatic relation. So there's no embassies in those countries of the other. Now they have it and they exchange ideas. They now can travel together and they plan a lot of things together to reach out to prosperity in the region. So that was the background which triggered us in the government of Gangwon to begin to think about how to do and what to do in the Korean Peninsula. And especially, we wanted to get the countries in the Middle East to be involved in the peace process in Korean Peninsula. And I believe that that's happening now in this platform. And we are hoping for setting up a so-called ambassador's peace forum in which the ambassadors will gather together on a regular basis to discuss how we can tackle better the issue of conflict and peace promotion. And now we have the three ambassadors with us, but this is just a beginning, a launch pad for further development in this direction. And uh, I, I, I've been very encouraged because when I visited embassies, they themselves proposed this idea. One day, I visited the Embassy of Israel, meeting with the Deputy Chief of Mission there. Uh, we had a very fruitful discussion about peace process involving countries in the Middle East for the Korean Peninsula. And the Deputy Chief of Mission suggested, why don't you think in such a way that that uh, Abraham Accord not only happens in the White House in the US, but also in Korean Peninsula, because that is a diplomatic peace accord. So why don't we engage ambassadors of those countries who used to be in conflict to come to the common platform and talk with one another? That was very exciting agenda. So I, I visited the embassy of uh, the UAE, which finally led him, the, His Excellency Ambassador uh, of UAE, to come visit the governor of Gangwon. And uh, the diplomatic relations has been uh, developing in a very exciting way. So I want to learn, and along with all of us, such lessons, how the countries in the Middle East could find the breakthroughs uh, which they have, they have not experienced before and uh, what it implies to the Korean Peninsula. Now, uh, one of the stories that I heard, in fact, I read from the Jerusalem Post 
which featured uh, one man whose name is Dan Shaham. He was a special envoy to the United Arab Emirates at uh, IRENA, that is International Renewable Energy Agency. In fact, before they reach political agreement, they did something very interesting that was energy diplomacy. So energy had come ahead of political discussions, which has led eventually to political agreement that is called historic Abraham Accord. So now Korea is trying a peace new deal. In this, I hope that the countries of the Middle East being engaged with Korean people for the process of peace in the peninsula. And this is a small background story. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee. And now it is time for us to go into the in-depth discussion on the Abraham Accords. Uh, <clears throat> May I introduce the first speaker from uh, Foreign Ambassadors? Uh, uh, His Excellency Akiba Tor, the Ambassador of Israel to Seoul. He served as head of the Bureau for World Jewish Affairs and World Religions and Deputy Director for Palestinian Affairs in the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs and served also as an advisor to the President of Israel on World Jewish Affairs. He studied at Harvard University, Kennedy School of Government, and Hebrew University, and Columbia University. Hmm. <laughs> He's interested in running, mountain biking, and ascending high places. <laughs> okay, now, uh, Ambassador Tor, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a great honor to be here at the Pyongyang Jiancheng, uh, Pyongyang Peace Forum. But the greatest honor for any Israeli ambassador is to appear on the same stage with, uh, with my colleagues who are my neighbors, the ambassadors of our neighboring Arab states. So this is really our greatest honor. And just something interesting, my deputy who gave you this idea for this panel is herself an Israeli Muslim Arab woman. So it's just interesting how bridges are built. Okay. Um, Look, what I wanted to say, I wanted to speak very briefly about a few ideas about the Israel-Arab peace process making and what is similar and what is different to the challenge here on the Korean Peninsula. A number of things happened which enabled the Abraham Accords in, in my understanding. Number one, there was a maturation of processes in the region. Israel's first peace treaty was with the Arab Republic of Egypt in 1979. That was followed by the Oslo Accords with the Palestinian National Movement in 1993, which have not reached the place that we would like. Afterwards, a successful peace treaty with the Kingdom of Jordan in 1995. And then in the last year, uh, agreements with United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, the Kingdom of Morocco. And this will surely spread, I don't know exactly when, but it will spread and it will deepen in the process. Uh, to a certain extent, I think that we saw here a convergence of interests among states. The moderate Sudi states who are exercising a certain kind of modernity, democratic values in their societies, feel a strong threat from an emerging Shiite power, which Iran, which is trying to achieve weapons of mass destruction. We fear, uh, we, f we share this, uh, this concern together with them. And uh, in the Middle East, something like this, uh, basically a sort of a, a national security, a, a regional security emergency brings uh, people together. We can't, we can't afford to be standoffish if there's really no reason for it, especially when we're, we're looking at something uh, considerably threatening, which threatens all of us. Then there's a, the very important element of 
of uh, leadership. In, in this case, there was a strong U.S. leadership under, under the Trump administration. And now, uh, United States leadership is not essential for these things to happen, but it can be a very important catalyst. For example, the Oslo Accords signed with the PLO were signed without American involvement. But every other uh, peace treaty achieved between Israel and Arab neighbors it was accompanied by strong American diplomacy. And uh, that certainly helped here, and we, we owe a vote of thanks to our American friends. Uh, there's also the issue of courageous national leadership at home. Uh, His Majesty the King of Morocco, the royal leadership of the United Arab Emirates, to move forward to make peace with Israel is never something simple. It means uh, confronting a public opinion, if not at home, then throughout the Arab world. Just last night, I was watching a, um, a videotape of a, a very recent television program on, Al Al on Algerian public television. The discussion was whether uh, it would be possible for Algeria and Israel to play each other uh, in, in Olympic Games. And uh, except for one person on the panel, the, all of the panelists were deeply against this. But what was really shocking is that one of the speakers, by the way, in Western dress and speaking very calmly, he said, look, um, there was an Algerian citizen that was involved in the team that attacked the Israeli Olympic team in Munich in 1972. And we cannot say that what he did was wrong. So what I mean to say is that we had very courageous national leadership of all of the countries uh, who came together to make peace because it's not simple in the Middle East. And that, that has to be, people have to be aware of that. Now, I think uh, an important lesson that I hope that all of our countries will, will learn from the past and, and, and will apply is the importance of people-to-people -people diplomacy. Because in my view, one of the mistakes uh, in the uh, process of making peace between Israel and the Palestinians, which has not gotten to where we want it to be, was that the people-to-people -people track was abandoned very early on. It was abandoned because um, uh, Chairman Yasser Arafat felt that people-to-people -people was a concession. It was a, a sort of normalization before uh, agreements were made on all other issues. And the Israeli leadership, I think, uh, it's my personal opinion, made the mistake of, of not insisting on continuing with people-to-people. -people. Because if you don't have people-to-people uh, -people activity and if you don't have like a growing of, uh, of bringing societies close together, then the moment you run into serious political problems at the level of leadership, you don't have any of the societal bridge or you haven't grown any of the inter-societal understanding which is required to weather political crisis. So, I actually don't think that we're going to have this, this problem at all. Uh, Ambassador of United Emirates just told me that when he was back home, uh, United Arab Emirates was full of Israelis. And my friend, Ambassador of Morocco, we both know Israel is full of Israeli Moroccan Jews who are just dying to come and see Morocco and to pay homage to the king that they love. So I think the process of building uh, societal relations will, will go well. But it's something that we have to do and, and, and we shouldn't uh, neglect it. Now in terms of the uh, issue here on the Korean Peninsula, and I, I, I won't pretend to be any sort of expert, but from what I see, the question of legitimacy in peacemaking is very different because the question in Arab-Israeli peacemaking always was the question, do the Jews, are the Jews a nation, and do they have a right to a homeland in lands which are historically lands of Islam or in the Middle East? So it was a, it's a question of, do we have a right to be there physically at all? 
Whereas in the North-South Korean conflict, no one argues, no one would argue that any Korean citizen of Seoul or Busan or of Pyongyang or Kaesong, whether they have a right to live where they are. The question is, what is the appropriate system of government? Which is, what is the appropriate economic system for delivering goods? And what is the le legitimate government? But you don't have a debate about the actual legitimacy of the people there. Now, I think that this can be, in some ways, a more difficult problem and a less difficult problem. Because when your question is one of recognition of uh, another people's national rights, it's possible to compromise. It's possible to say, for example, uh, when Israel and the Palestinian people eventually do achieve peace. So we'll say, okay, uh, we can achieve our national aims to a certain extent, you to a certain extent. At some point, we have to compromise. But there'll be a Palestinian national government and there'll be an Israeli national government and, and we'll, 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 we'll reach some sort of, uh, of, of, of solution between, between ourselves. Here in Korea, I can see challenges. I can see challenges on this issue that we don't face. There's another issue uh, in our region. Actually, the conflict was much more violent in the last 70 years, although I do believe that if you will take the entire number of total wounded and dead in all of Israel's uh, um, wars, uh, all the wars between Israel and the Arab states, I don't think that you will come close to the numbers of those that were lost in the Korean Civil War between 1950 and 1953. But since then, in the last 70 years, it's been quite bloody by us, and uh, more so than by you. Uh, how to, my final point, how to, how to solidify the peace, what to do, uh, what can Korea do? What can the ROK government do here? And I think there's actually quite a lot. And um, look, the... Um, Korean business, uh, to a certain extent, Korean government, has sometimes been risk averse or has considered that deepening a relationship with Israel comes at the cost of a relationship with the very, very important economies, energy economies and construction economies of the Persian Gulf, as well as friendships in North Africa and elsewhere. And I think that what the Abraham Accords teach is that this is a misconception, a deep misconception. It's not a zero-sum game. And actually, there are incredible opportunities here. United Arab Emirates uh, is a very, very skillful country in terms of finance, but also in terms of aggregation of uh, knowledge about solar energy. Israel is a technology leader in terms of uh, alternative energy. And Korea is, is, uh, is a, a, in terms of uh, industrial, technological, and marketing capacity is maybe the most brilliant country in the world. So there's all of the place for us to work together and just to help each other. And this will surely deep, deepen the process. And I'm certain that, that we can find similar things to do with Morocco and also with our friends in Europe, together with the very, very dynamic economy of the Republic of Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, <coughs> Ambassador Thor. Oh, your presentation is impressive. A lot of points, a lot of t talk points, actually, uh, uh, when we get uh, a free discussion about how Korea can um, learn from the lessons and experiences in Middle East. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker, uh, His Excellency Abdullah Saif Al Duaimi, uh, Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, after completing several graduate courses in the United States, he joined the uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority as a senior analyst uh, specializing in the U.S. market. In 1997, he was a second deed to the privatization committee for the water and electricity sector in the Abu Dhabi Emirate, taking on the role of director of independent water and power producers project. From November 2016 till present, 
He has assumed the duty as the UAE ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Ambassador Al Duaimi, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the governor of Guan Won for the invitation and give us the chance to share with them our uh, experience in the Abrahamic Accord. Uh, my speech will be on the historical achievement made by my country, United Arab Emirates, and the Middle East peace process through the signing of the Arab, uh, Abraham Accord with Israel and the United States in August 2020. The naming of uh, Accord after Abraham is recognition of the Arab and Jewish people that Abraham, their common ancestor. The Accord was followed with the signing of the treaty peace between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, September 2020. The treaty entitled the establishment of peace, diplomatic relation, and full normalization of the bilateral ties between the UAE and Israel. It's also called enhancing bilateral cooperation in the areas of trade, finance, investment, civil aviation, science, innovation, healthcare, and tourism, amongst others. Thus, this agreement represents a historical achievement for creating immediate and meaningful security, economy, and social benefit in the region. The UAE decision to sign the two documents is in line with its policy orientation toward tolerance and peaceful coexisting with other nations and cultures. The UAE believes that these agreements are considered as a first significant action toward era of security and prosperity. It also believes that the bilateral ties with Israel and the two countries' cooperation with the United States of America on the region matters represent a great potential on diplomatic, scientific, cultural, and economic domains. In addition, these steps meet the aspiration of the UAE people as well as the people in the region for stability and prosperity. The agreement paved a new path for achieving these goals through creation of job opportunities, especially for youth that represent 65% of the region population where they are less than 30 years old. It should be mentioned here that the opinion polls have indicate the majority of young people in the region prefer cooperation with Israel for a constructive solution to the decade-long Palestinian question. The agreement reinforced that the UAE deep and long-standing commitment to the Palestinian people. It is consistent with the UN resolution, which called on a member state to intensify effort to achieve a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in the Middle East. For that, it has been met with a board of international support. The process of a direct bilateral relation with Israel will naturally take many gradual stages. However, effort to realize that the potential of the treaty are moving rapidly. The UAE and Israel are already collaborating closely to expand and intensify research and treatment of COVID-19. In addition, working group from the two countries are making progress on a range of bilateral cooperation initiative across key sectors. I should mention that during 2019-2020 that the UAE hosted a Bob this first visit to the Arabian Peninsula became the first Arab country to launch a, uh, a probe to, to Mars and made a historic diplomatic breakthrough with Israel. The above mentioned event show that the distinctive UAE model that is based on tolerance, the progress of all forms, world-class hub 
for business innovation, international cooperation, cultural and a future oriented society for other nations in the region to follow. Later this year, the UAE will host Expo 2020 Dubai. In 2nd of December of 2021, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the UAE Foundation. Before I leave the podium, I should reaffirm that the UAE remain resilient and hopeful in facing the COVID-19 pandemic and its difficult economic fallout. As we think about peace in Korea Peninsula, the signing of the peace agreement between the UAE and Israel could also be a good example for the Republic of Korea and its effort toward peaceful coexisting and commitment to prosperity with its northern neighbors. Hope that today's forum will contribute positively to the peace in the Korean Peninsula and around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Noaimi. Mm. The next speaker is uh, Ambassador of Morocco, uh, His Excellency Chafik Rashadi. Am I right? Rashadi. <laughs> Uh, he's from uh, Marrakesh, Morocco. He was a renowned politician from 2002 through 2016. He was elected as a member of parliament for three consecutive terms as served as a vice president of the Moroccan parliament. During his parliamentary mandate, he chaired several projects and partnerships between the parliament and international organizations such as the World Bank, Westminster Foundation for Democracy and the European Union. October 2016, he was accredited by His Majesty the King of Morocco as Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Ambassador, uh, please. Thank you, Excellencies, my fellow ambassadors, distinguished guests, representative of media, ladies and gentlemen. May peace and mercy of God be upon you all. I titled my contribution to this forum, Peace is a Verb, not a Noun. And you will understand why I chose this title throughout my presentation. But first, I would like to say that I am deeply grateful that through the hard work of the organizers and staff, we can meet safely today, despite the ongoing challenges of COVID-19. Further, I want to wish everyone good fortune and success for the Lunar New Year. Peace is a word invoked and dreamed of by billions of people across the world. A dream that humans from every language, background, creed, and experience all share. Korea, has had its share of difficulties in the past centuries, including the yoke of colonization, the agony of civil war, and the precarious balancing act of rebuilding. However, this nation has also demonstrated on international stage the daily hard work that is required to ensure the dream of peace. Indeed, Kwanwondo, this province that shares its border with North Korea, knows Firsthand, that peace is a national foundation for prosperity and success. So it's here in Pyeongchang that two Koreas join together to compete under a unified flag in 2018 Winter Olympics. And it's here that the rest of the world join them in that competition that represents the best of human cooperation. Pyeongchang. The very name calls upon the dream that has brought the world here as the name of the area means the flourishing of peace. It's only fitting then that the Syrian mountain area should host the Pyeongchang Peace Forum and bring together different representatives from around the world to discuss the, uh, that peace we all crave. However, we must also remember that peace is not a passive state, but an active process. 
each region and nation present here. Konwando, Germany, Israel, United States, the United Arab Emirates, and my own country, the Kingdom of Morocco, has experience in their history and their present that teach us that peace is a verb, not a noun. In the case of our region and nation, peace has not been a quiet affair, but instead a constant reconciliation and dialogue. In that spirit, I wish to see this forum as a springboard for ongoing communication that will create the active dialogue, not only here, but throughout the Korean Peninsula, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and the world beyond. May the seeds of understanding and discussion that we plan today truly bring a flourishing of peace in the year to come. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let, let's move on to the second part. The Kid of Morocco has a legacy of peace that is has meant for centuries. My country is an international crossroad in the north of Africa and a mere 14 kilometers from Europe with both Atlantic and Mediterranean Sea coast. Arab, Berber, African, Mediterranean, and Europe culture has met and mingled here over hundreds of years, creating a unique space of acceptance and dialogue that have been ensured in our constitution. Further, religious tolerance has always played a role in our nation history. Not unlike Korea, the formation of the Kingdom of Morocco be began in the 7th and 8th century. Across the Vario dynasty, the Islamic Kingdom developed, becoming a haven Sephardic Jewish, escaping the in Inquisition and other Pequisition, while also being a home Christian since the time of Roman Empire. Seeking peace, acceptance of diverse governance, as well as culture, the Kingdom of Morocco became the first country to organize the United States of America after their brink with Britain. Later, during the year of the French protectorate, the peaceful coexistence of religions remained an essential fact, notably witness it in the late King Mohammed V's refusal to hand Moroccan Jews over the concentration camps during the Holocaust. After independence in 1956, Morocco began to actively seek to, re to regain its place on the world the diplomatic scene. It opened diplomatic relations with many friendly countries, such as the Republic of Korea in 1962, and continued strong partnership with, with these countries. Morocco has repeatedly had to commit itself to its peaceful legacy in a rapidly changing world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a small selection of my country's important events from the past few decades. In 1975, the late King Hassan II called upon the citizens of, of the country to participate in the Green March, an event where 350,000 unarmed people marched into the Sahara to peacefully assert the sovereignty of the country. The current King, His Majesty King Mohammed VI, record is a unique example of mobilization, discipline, and, and pursuit of what is just. The recovered Sahara region became an economic hub, a lending center of cooperation and geostrategic space dedicated to peace, st stability, and shared uh, prosperity. In addition to this economic and social momentum, the southern provinces of Morocco are experiencing a diplomatic break a breakthrough and a great dynamic with the opening of consulates from 19 countries thus far, such as the United Arab Emirates. This region is Moroccan by law, by history, by the will of its population, and by growing support of its national committee and the friend of Morocco, including official recognition by the United States of America in 2020 of the Moroccan Southern of our southern provinces. 
every step of the way from the founding of our kingdom more than a million ago to, to now, my country had had to commit and recommit to daily activity of peace, tolerance, dialogue, and reconciliation have always been our watchword and the process that we actively pursue rather than passively anticipate. During a papal visit in 1985 by Pope jo uh, John Paul II, Morocco was able to set a precedent for the Catholic Church's relation with Islamic countries. In turn, King Mohammed VI visited the Vatican in 2000. In recent years, Morocco sought to commit once again to its reputation for peaceful dialogue. And in 2019, the country invited and hosted Pope Francis, who commanded the monarch and the country for working toward peace, combating extremism, violence, and terrorism. The Kingdom of Morocco seeks to promote political peace in its region as well. My country has hosted the inter-Libyan dialogue, seeking to conclude the proceeding with a comprehensive agreement to end the Libyan crisis. This involves helping the Libyan parties to find a political solution to their differences. Such an agreement will enable this Maghreb country to emerge from the chaos that began in 2011. Morocco's role in the negotiation has been widely praised by the international community, organization including the United Nations, the African Union, and the Arabic League have both welcomed and highlighted the constructive role uh, the Kingdom has played in resolving these conflicts. Since 1960, Morocco's ongoing commitment to serving international peace and security has led to its long-term contribution to, do, to UN peacekeeping operations. And indeed, we are widely held for their top-level top involvement. The experience and expertise acquired by Moroccan peacekeepers promotes the universal values of solidarity, dignity, and humanitarian assistance. Consequently, the Kingdom of Morocco has adopted an, an approach to anti-terrorism that is distinguished by a preventive dimension led with professionalism by Moroccan security forces. This approach has become and recognized at the regional and international level. My country carried that reputation for active peacekeeping further with the agreement in 2020 to create in Morocco the Program Office for Counterterrorism and Training in Africa, a branch of the UN of Counterterrorism. This program will aim to, to train people and disseminate practice in the fight against terrorism. As you can see, peace has always been a Moroccan verb, and my country steps further into the 20th century, we know our future is deeply, is deeply tied to, to, to the peace of origin of the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of my contribution. Through the Kingdom of Morocco experience concerning Morocco Sahara, and recently, the opening of formal diplomatic relations with Israel, we have experienced both division and union, and understand the toll that takes on a nation. Indeed, each country here has experiences that related to both division and union. Within the past century, I firmly believe that it was especially qualified each of us to come here to Pyongyang, another symbolic space of unity, to speak about the active processes of peace that take place in our nation, region, and the world. Hazrat Khan once said that God, God breaks the heart again and again and again until it stay open. Perhaps that it was we as countries who know both division and unity offer the world. The hearts of our nation may have been broken, but also means that they are open to, to those essential processes of tolerance, dialogue, and reconciliation. First and foremost, we need a safe gathering place to create the necessary dialogue between diverse groups. We're better than Pyongyang. Here, the organizer have maintained the peaceful space that we launched three years that that uh, launched three years ago during the Olympic and Paralympic Games. The world participate here in the game 
a symbol of the international unity, and we come here now to continue that active participation for peace. Second, it is essential that we insist that civil discourse and a fair uh, decision-making process take place here in this space, just as each participating nation bore, bore its flag in 2018, we acknowledge and accept diversity. At that time, the athletes had friendly competition where everyone could show, show, show their skills. And now it's a diplomatic of and representative come here in a friendly atmosphere to show our own peacekeeping and discussion skills. The Olympic always have judge and official to mediate and to resolve problem just as we can quickly move to reconciliate between conflicting and or jurist uh, groups. Finally, we cannot simply feel satisfied after a success peace forum held here among our group of, of participants with similar experiences and open uh, mindset. We must play an active role in peace process at home, in the region and, and abroad. On the Korea, Korean Peninsula, we can join our voices to those who have long fought for reconciliation and peace within, within South Korea and among its members. Similarly, the members of this forum are challenged to be the outspoken part that we will always start a difficult conversation, demand and expect reconciliation and work actively to bring conflict to a, to a more peaceful conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, the dream of the Korean people is to constantly pursue humanitarian love and peaceful dialogue as one unified people. Each country represented here understands through hard-won historical lesson that division and silence and inaction cannot create peace and serve no one. We can combine our experience in the mediation and, and equitable resolution to offer proactive and creative solution to the trade we face and the potential we must grasp. At every moment, we must remember that peace is not a resting state, a noun, but an active verb that requires our mobilization, discipline, and pursuit of what is just. Only then can we bring about the fruition of peace that Pyongyang promised to the world. May peace be upon you all, Kasamira. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. It was, it was very informative, impressive, and a very inspiring uh, presentation, and also emotional, too. Uh, now we have one last but, least, last, last but not least, uh, Ambassador of Germany to the Republic of Korea, uh, Mikhail, Mikhail Reifenstuhl, right? am I right? Thank you. Uh, floor is yours. Many, many thanks. The pronunciation of this difficult name were even excuse many... Excuse me, excuse me. I forgot, I forgot some introductory remarks on you. I was a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> so please. please wait for me just one minute. Uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Reifenstuhl, uh, is from uh, Tergenzi, Germany. He studied law in Ludwig Maximilian University in München and University of Georgia at Athens, jo Georgia in the United States of America. He became a foreign service officer in 1993 and worked in lots of countries. The list includes Bosnia, Herzegovina, United Kingdom, India, Egypt, Turkey. He also had duties at the headquarter in Germany on various kinds of missions, including overseas communications, strategy and policy planning, cultural diplomacy, legal affairs, non-proliferation, and regional affairs with nations in the Middle East. Very, very long lists. Please go ahead. I think you mentioned much more than I was aware. So again, if I may say, so first of all, many, many thanks for the, for the invitation to the Pyeongchang. Um, Peace Forum, um, being here just uh, half a year, um, six, six and a half months, um, this is a great honor um, and pleasure for me. So um, somehow, um, I'm a bit, um, I think, in a, in, a, in a 
somewhat different position and because obviously Germany is not um, part of the um, Middle East. Um, and so I think <clears throat> I would like to, to um, restrain myself um, to a couple of short remarks. Um, one, two, actually on the um, accords of normalization um, between Israel and um, various um, Arab countries. And then um, maybe some, some short remarks, um, food for discussion, maybe for the issue um, of the inner Korean dialogue of the peace process, how to get Korea reunificated, and perhaps um, there are one or two um, interesting points which I can add from the German perspective. Whereas I always would like to, to caution, because I think um, it's never possible really to, trans to transfer any historical experience from one region to another, um, because there are many, many differences. So um, on, on the um, accords of um, normalization um, between um, Israel, Morocco, United Arab Emirates, Sudan and Bahrain, um, I mean, first of all, let me um, say, as also my, my government has said, that we very much welcomed um, this step. We think it was a, um, a very substantial and um, important um, step um, towards, um, um, towards getting also a solution um, to the um, Middle East peace process. Um, we think it is um, important that we get progress there. And I think um, this is really um, a very important step towards peace that we all wish in the whole of the region. Um, my dear colleague um, from, from Israel um, um, and my friend um, Akiva, he mentioned one point, um, what I ex experienced myself um, also when I was in, in Cairo, um, but also extensively traveling um, in some of the Maghreb countries. I think one of the most important aspects, and that's what you mentioned, is actually um, creating people-to-people -people contacts. Um, it, it's one aspect um, that you have um, um, good relationships between, um, between the states, between um, the governments, um, but I think in the end, this is what we also experienced on, on other levels um, of, um, of relationship with third countries. If you are in a difficult political um, state of affairs, um, then if you have good, intensive, independently, working people-to-people -people contacts of the different fields of society, be it from the parliamentary field, be it by the, of the field of science, of civil society, of pressure groups, climate, whatever you have. I think this is, and this comes very near to what you said, Akiva, I always call it, it's some kind of a safety net um, for, for bilateral relations. So I think um, this is something um, what, what I'm personally very much looking forward, that um, this also develops between, between uh, Israel and, and the Arab states, because I think in the end, um, uh, a, solution of this, um, uh, a solution of this issue and peace, lasting peace in, in the Middle East really also depends um, a, a lot, not only on the political side, but also that there will be people-to-people -people, um, contacts as some kind of, of um, safety net. Um, second, a very short remark, um, uh, as it was mentioned, but I think it can't be underlined sufficiently in the field of diplomacy, um, it's never a zero-sum game. If you start negotiations as a zero-sum game, then um, most probably uh, you, never, you never will succeed. So I think um, it, it's obvious um, that there must be interests, and there are interests from all um, countries um, and that, that were involved. And I think this is um, also good because it gives much more stability and, um, and durability to these kind of accords if there are also um, um, interests um, involved. And, and something what I also think is important that even if you do have on, on some issues um, different opinions, and this I think is very normal, if you come to the level between, between states, um, uh, for example, like with us and Morocco, where we do have a very, very intensive um, and good relation, but on some issues, like on the Sahara issue, we do have different opinions. So I think this is very important that despite uh, you have differences, you have different opinions, you continue to uh, search where are your common interests and to simply define them and, and work on them. So um, first remark on the, uh, on the inner uh, Korean um, situation. Um, I think it is um, remarkable and, and we, we look with a, a very high um, uh, respect for the, the um, ongoing efforts of um, President Moon and, um, and his government to get this inner Korean dialogue 
um, again moving. Um, it's obviously it's uh, it seems to be very very difficult. I'm a newcomer, but I think. Um, one can see there were coming um, again and again uh, proposals for different fields of cooperation. Also, um, when he was at the um, United Nations, um, he mentioned it also. Um, and there's not much response. Um, but I think, and, and this is one German experience, um, I think it's important um, to continue uh, with this kind of, um, um, of policy because if we, um, and even, even if this is sometimes internally um, very heavily criticized. If, if we um, and now would draw a comparison um, to, to Germany, if we um, uh, think back to Germany where we had reunification in 1989, um, there was one um, politician, it, it was the Social Democrat government um, under Willy Brandt, who actually uh, changed um, German um, policy towards, um, uh, towards the Eastern. Um, towards the Eastern Bloc uh, and in particular um, towards the um, GDR and he tried to create some kind of um, dialogue um, policy. This was at the beginning to the very fierce opposition um, of um, especially um, the Christian Democrats. Um, one can say this today and it took a while that uh, really also the political spectrum uh, was convinced of, um, of this but he continued even if it was not always at the very beginning successful but he continued and they established what I think um, was very very helpful in the end when then suddenly suddenly reunification was coming um, that um, there was some kind of ways um, avenues um, prepared somehow to handle this this very very complex and, and difficult um, uh, process of reunification difficult from a social aspect difficult from very different societies um, difficult uh, with regard um, to um, to wealth distribution and how you um, could get um, an, an, in the eastern part um, economy um, again uh, also competitive so there were many many channels um, but this early starting of a process, people-to-people -people contacts, family visits, um, and many other things, uh, in the end, I think it was quite, quite um, instrumental and helping um, to ease the reunification process. And that's my last remark. Um, uh, when I think back um, to um, German reunification, I was just traveling as a backpacker in China, <clears throat> so I learned only a couple days later of it. Um, and when I saw it um, at the television screen first, um, I, I thought it was some kind of science fiction movie. So w what I want to explain is if you would have made a, a survey one year beforehand in Germany um, amongst the population, um, will there be reunification in one year, in 10 years, in 20 years? Um, I don't know how high the percentage would have been um, to say that there would be a, a reunification coming. And the second one, and this goes to an inner Korean discussion, if you would have asked people, um, this will be very costly. Are you really willing um, to spend this money for reunification? I don't know what the result of, um, um, especially the younger generation, in, in the western part of Germany uh, would have been. And there comes in the leadership issue. Um, when the chance was there and when the geopolitical climate was there um, to, to realize this, um, then, then, then we had um, courageous leadership um, from our German side. We had European partners, but we had above all one US president who really, um, we th um, I think we can say we, can, uh, we thank, uh, we are very grateful that he enabled us to have the reunification. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, <clears throat> so we have we have 24 minutes left. That's that's not bad, I think. We still have the time to have a free discussion, and then uh, probably, uh, hopefully, we have a Q and A session. Uh, it's, uh, I would like to focus more on this part and implication from the experience regarding the Abraham Accords towards the situation in Korean Peninsula. Uh, does anyone, does anyone of us have a topic to discuss more or, or talk more during this period? Anybody? Mm. If there is no one raised to raise, yes, I prepared one. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to ask a question to all of you. Um, what was the most crucial element for the success of the Abraham Accords? 
As uh, Ambassador Thor already mentioned, some of them, uh, there are uh, several elements we might think of. Uh, for example, it might be security measure uh, against a common adversary in the region. I would not say the name of the country, but uh, security issue. And it might be an opportunity for an economic prosperity, or it might be a powerful diplomatic initiative by the former president of the US, uh, Donald Trump, his leadership, right? Which one do you think is the most decisive factor uh, for the success of the deal? And can it be, can it be applied to, the, to this region, to the Korean Peninsula? This is something I would like to give you, give, think, you think a little bit more. So uh, everybody has a one, uh, uh, say and uh, two minutes. I will give you two minutes and this time the other way. So Ambassador Reifen, sure, you're the first. Well, this is a bit awkward asking me um, because we are not part, we are part um, uh, not of the um, agreements on normalization. Um, so I cannot say this is really up for the parties, um, and I have to say. But I think in general, um, perhaps um, simply uh, one or two remarks. I think in, probably in the end, it, uh, I don't know it for this case, but I think in the end it's always a combination of aspects that have um, to come um, together, and, and there partly I will repeat myself. Um, there must be an interest. Probably it was also good that there was some kind of ripening of the situation. That, that, that's what my Israeli um, colleague also mentioned. Um, there, there are mutual, um, uh, all the countries in the region benefit from it. Yeah? Um, so this is something, um, what, what I think is, is, is one of the um, very important um, aspects. Um, leadership, um, as I mentioned, um, um, but I think this is not this is not the only issue, um, and then probably uh, sometimes it's also important um, that you have a co coincidence of interest that simply every of the parties has maybe one or two um, specific points um, that are very important for them, and that you can somehow um, get it in the deal done. Um, but this is very abstract, and it's not really up to me um, to, um, to to qualify this. Um, here in the region, um, I don't know, um, I'm, I'm now for half a year here, and this is a very, very complex um, um, process. There are many things that are unique um, here in the region. Um, for example, that you also do have um, a neighbor um, that is developing uh, nuclear weapons. So we have uh, one, one issue that is it's very, very different um, to the situation in, in, in the Middle East, um, uh, a country that is, is continuously um, upgrading its uh, nuclear arsenals, its ballistic missile systems, what is a, what is a um, very, very substantial concern for us, not only for the stability on the region here, but also because of um, secondary proliferation issues. So I think here probably one of the most challenging aspects will be the inner Korean dialogue peace process, but also combine it with, um, with the task um, that somehow, um, somehow we need a process going in um, to um, into, um, um, uh, uh, this is not up for me to say, but into um, some kind of um, procedure, how you get um, denuclearization done, what is important for us, and that in the end it must be, um, it must be really uh, verifiable, it must be complete, uh, and other issues. I think this is, this is probably one of the most tricky issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Ambassador Rashadi, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I I think the crucial thing that uh, uh, very important that we have to underline here is exactly the leadership. The leadership, of course, the leadership is very important. And all, uh, I, yeah, I can tell you the leadership of our, uh, for, for example, of our king, uh, Muhammad VI, and before him, his father, and before him, his grandfather. That means it's something that uh, is a legacy of leadership. And also, uh, and also, the, uh, uh, yeah, what happened with, uh, between Morocco and Israel is, is more than a normalization. Uh, because you have, you have to come back to the history, to the history, and it starts uh, from centuries. And the, the, this, uh, this relation between our two nations, and uh, also uh, the, the successful of, of the deal. And uh, I, I don't know if you, if you follow, 
what's happened in Morocco uh, when the delegation of Israel visited to Morocco and when, uh, when the head of the delegation starts speaking not only Arabic, but he starts he start, he start speaking dialect, Moroccan dialect. That Moroccan dialect, and he was he was he, uh, he was in front of the journalist, and uh, he was speaking with the Moroccan dialect. That's mean. That's that, uh, that's mean that is something that is not. Uh, we don't wake up one day, one morning, and we said, okay, let's uh, let's uh, let's do that. Is something coming from the history? Is something, of course, is is uh, the base is the leadership of uh, our king, and it's a process also and also. Uh, I think that uh, during my presentation, what, uh, what I said, that the peace is a verb, it's not a noun. We, we, uh, uh, exactly what's happened also, uh, we, we can't, I, I was here in 2018 in Pyeongchang uh, Olympic Games, and uh, all the world, all the world was watching, was watching the two Koreas together under one flag and uh, going, uh, going together to compete. To compete, to compete, of course, it is, uh, we are speaking about games, to compete against to others. To, uh, to others. That's, that, that is the hope for, of all Koreans. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, uh, Ambassador Al Duaimi, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the reason why we do this, the Framework Accord now, I think uh, things change uh, from time to time. And I think, uh, as I said in my speech, uh, majority of this region, more than 65%, they are below 30 years. Imagine what's going to happen if there is no any peace in the Middle East. I think UAE uh, have a different, this is part of our, by the way, policy uh, toward tolerance. And I think uh, this conflict with Israel has been very many years, and it could not be continued forever. So we have to come in a peace. I think UAE uh, paved the way, and others will follow. Uh, we can see Morocco, we can see Bahrain, we can see uh, uh, Sudan, and maybe in the future, more they are coming from the Arab country. Uh, I think that the conflict between Palestine and Israel, it's, uh, sometimes it's an advantage for others, like a terrorist group, to, be, to use this, not because sake of the care about Israel or Palestine, but for their other agenda in the region. Uh, without mentioning it, it's a clear for you what's going on. I think if we don't do something toward peace in the Middle East, as I said, majority of the region is uh, young people. Imagine if there is no stability, no job for them. This is easy target to be uh, uh, attracted by terrorist group. And in that case, will never end in that region, the Middle East. It's not a, this is, we're looking for prosperity and stability of the region. And I think this is a desire, as His uh, Excellency said, of our leader also. So it's a desire for everybody. I think we need to come to conclusion. We need, uh, at the end, everybody is really uh, seeking for peace. And also we hope that this model will roll uh, to uh, North and South Korea. Uh, to to be uh, uh, live in a peaceful manner. Uh, again, as I say, that's really it's an ambitious and a desire of the leaders of the two country, for sake of the benefit of their country and the prosperity and looking to the future. Now in UAE, we're looking not just a conflict. We're looking to the future. We send a probe to the Mars. Uh, I mean, we invite the popes in 2019. We're looking to, to get the world to closer and to really live peacefully. And we want this model to be rolled all around across the world and all the region. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, Ambassador Thor. I just wanted to uh, share with the audience, I, I think uh, you should know that it's it's really the deep, hope of all of us, and I think of the entire international community, that the Korean Peninsula, primarily the Korean people, will find a way to reunite. Now, on the other hand, North Korea, you have a very difficult situation, and not only you, we also. We're always looking at the problem of proliferation and what it means for our region, 
the movement of missile technology, weaponization, uranium enrichment from Pyongyang to Tehran is something of very, very deep concern. And indeed, it's a security crisis for the entire world. Um, however, uh, when I was listening to the speakers, so I, I admit, I apologize, I Googled the photographs of the, uh, of the uh, United uh, Women's Hockey Team. And I have to admit, I felt very emotional. It was really something very beautiful. It would have even been more beautiful if they would have beaten Sweden and all the other teams. That would have been incredible, but maybe that's too much to ask. Um, look, I agree with my colleagues that the, we, it, 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 on the one hand, you can't allow things to slide. You have to be proactive. Uh, Sh Shafiq said that uh, the um, uh, piece is a verb. And you know, during the 90s, when Israel was working on the interim agreement following the Oslo agreement with the uh, Palestinian Authority, there were people in my ministry, I remember as a young diplomat, who would say, oh, the peace process is irreversible. We'll, we'll never be going back. You know, that's not correct. It, it's very reversible. So uh, you, you have to certainly verbalize the word peace. However, I think that uh, every young, middle-aged, and even elderly Korean should leave, live with the hope that this will certainly happen sooner or later because it's sort of like a force of gravity. It really, it's irrational that the Korean people should not be united, that they should not be sharing the same landmass. It doesn't make sense. And generally, uh, in the course of uh, human history, things that don't make sense find a way to reverse themselves and to, to go, go the right way. But uh, as uh, Michael said, it can be very, very sudden, like the falling of the Berlin Wall. By the way, the emergence of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and the, the freedoms which came to the Soviet Union were also very much unexpected by Kremlinologists, had no idea that that would happen. So, one should always be prepared for unexpected good news. But the uh, tradition, the Jewish tradition, uh, our tradition about uh, waiting for the Messiah is the Messiah can come today, uh, but surely he will come even if he tarries. And uh, I think that's not only a religious uh, dictum, I think that's uh, an idea of hope in the human spirit. It will happen. I, I think so. It's not a state position of the state of Israel, but uh, and uh, I, I think that Koreans should not give up on it. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, now, Dr. Lee, you have to say. <laughs> no, uh, two minutes. I, actually, I don't have a comment on it, on it, but I like to ask questions to the ambassadors. Uh, that is... Uh, Excuse what? me, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, we have just seven and, uh, seven and a half minutes, so y y do you think it is possible? Okay, yeah, just a brief question and brief answer. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my, uh, my question is simple, you know, what you all, like all your countries could do to facilitate peace process in the Korean Peninsula? So, uh, I'm not uh, again the first. Maybe one or two uh, ambassadors, maybe, uh, okay, uh, uh, Ambassador Toru. I think we have enough work on our plate. We, we, have to, we, we, have to, we have to complete making peace in our region. We have to be a good example. But, uh, and we also have to be uh, very, very humble and not try to tell you how to handle the situation which you have, which is extremely challenging. As His Excellency, I think we have to be a good example. Um, I'm a member in, the, in the, what they call it the Future Council, which is one of the council is uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula. I'm a member in this uh, council. This council is a member from different parts of the world. And uh, I'm sure uh, the, the proverbs and the governance, uh, they, they know about it. Uh, it's really more talk about toward um, the peaceful manner what we're going to do after the normalization relation between North and South, 
how we look at it from political side and also from the economic side. So there is a lot of discussion. I'm a board member in this council, so this is what I can say that really we can support. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I, uh, I join my colleagues uh, what they said, and I want only to add that, uh, that the discussion and uh, the negotiation must be uh, under uh, exactly what's happened. I, I, I come back again to what's happened here in this place, in Pernchong in 2018, when they took Korea's work and, and hands one in a, in a fighting flag. That's what I want to say, that the negotiation must be with a mind, with a mind that is only is a peninsula. In that case, they can, the negotiation can go further, it's, and it's a hope for all the world, because peace is not only a, a part of the world. We need peace in every part of the world, and of course, we need peace, and, and uh, as the slogan say, peace here and now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, please. <clears throat> um, two remarks. I mean, first of all, um, between um, the Korean government and, and, and the German government, we do have certain um, tracks where we are um, speaking. For example, one is um, between your unification ministry and our ministry of economics, where there's a regular exchange once a year on the socio-economic consequences we had in Germany um, of reunification. We have exchanges between parliamentarians and so on. So that there is an exchange, and I think it's, by the way, a two-way learning process always. It's never, it's never a one-way road. Um, and, and we, from our side, um, also um, um, two weeks ago, when we has, uh, had our last um, high-ranking um, telephone call between our ministries, um, it, it all also was said again from our side, if and wherever we, we could be helpful, um, um, of course, we are very much uh, looking um, into it and we are willing to look into it. Um, but I think um, this is really first and foremost, of course, um, up to um, Korea, to the uh, Korean government um, to define. But uh, in a very humble role, what we only could play, we always would be very much willing to help where it is possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, yes, uh, now, uh, Ambassador Peck, please. Uh, I have met, met many questions, but the, oh, we don't have enough time. Therefore, the, uh, I would like to ask uh, Ambassador of Germany just one question. Uh, as you know, the Gawang province is the only divided province in the Korean Peninsula. And the Gerlich, uh, a German city, uh, Gerlich is also divided city between uh, Germany and Poland. Uh, which communication or which relations happens between uh, East Gerlich and West Gerlich? Gerlich, not Gorlich, Gerlich. You, you know, you know about Gerlich? Gerlich, no? Sorry, let me take it. Um, this was probably um, a phonetical um, a problem um, from my side, um, but I can assure you um, I'm very much willing to look into it, as we diplomats always say, and, and then I will give you an answer afterwards. Many, many thanks. Sorry. Gerlich, uh, between uh, East Germany and Poland and uh, Czechoslovakia. Gerlich. Sorry, now, now, sorry, uh, this was really, um, I was difficult now. Görlitz, yes, uh, I mean, Görlitz is, um, it's not only um, a, a wonderful, a wonderful um, uh, rehabilitated city, um, but it is for us a very, very important um, symbol because it actually is um, divided by a river and um, one part of the city is in, is in Poland um, and, and, and the other part of the city is um, actually um, in Germany. And this was like with other cities, and there you are completely um, right, we have um, this kind of approaches 
Um, uh, we have between um, Poland and Germany, we have uh, between um, the Czech uh, Republic um, and, and Germany, and also, um, by the way, also in the Western part, where actually um, this kind of model of cooperation um, of cities um, can simply, um, I think, um, realize uh, what what we both or what we all mentioned um, people to people contacts yeah you, you can start very much on a local level on a um, uh, on a municipality um, and this very much can help to build it then um, step by step um, bigger we have it for example now also not only in municipalities but um, also in regions um, so I think yes absolutely this is one of the most um, promising um, um, ways how you can um, build for, for trust uh, trust and confidence. Sorry, that, that it was difficult to understand at the beginning. Is it okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have almost running out, uh, running out of time, but my watch tells me this, we have two more minutes. A little bit different, but thank you so much. So we have two more minutes, and, uh, but uh, two minutes is a little bit um, too short to have Q&A session, so I would like to skip the Q&A session. Instead, I would like to uh, give a, a brief remark myself uh, as a kind of a closing remark. Uh, I think the successful peace deal was possible because the people in the region, as you all, all of you said, uh, did, did not give up the hope. That is one of the most important part. It's not easy to decide which element is the most important, but the people of Israel, the UAE, Morocco, did not give up the hope that the peace will come. This is very important, I think. The next point I think very important is, is a incentive. An incentive is necessary to make a deal. The incentive should be a good thing, not only for us, but also for them too. In other words, the incentive should be good not only for South Korea, but also for North Korea in uh, Korean Peninsula. The last point is that uh, the balance between domestic preparedness and international environment, I think we know that the golden opportunity for the extremely difficult issue will come, uh, especially the window of opportunity is opening when the world environment is changing, but we don't know when it is coming, so we need to be prepared domestically to catch the opportunity and communicate with the world so that we can smell out what is coming, what is going. So this special session is one of the most optimal event for us to prepare for the future and to communicate with the world. I think, as uh, Dr. Lee said already, that the uh, Gangwon province uh, better try to regularize this session, special session with foreign ambassadors under the name of Foreign Ambassadors Forum or round table or something. I think this is very important to start. I think this is the end of, so I think this is the end of our discussion. I want to thank all panels for the lively and quality discussion and everybody who prepared this event. Good luck everybody, have a wonderful evening.